Okay. okay. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our weekly venting hour. Today, January 25th, 2024, Thursday. Thank you um, to all of you for joining us. Uh, we're going to take a moment just to pray, and uh, then uh, we, we will follow the usual format with where uh, I'll take about 10 15 minutes to share on our theme this morning where we're going to talk about vision to execution uh, just to share some practical things on how you know god gives us a vision and how we go about uh, fulfilling that vision so we'll talk about that for about 10 15 minutes share some thoughts and then we'll open it up for a time of questions uh, answers and discussion sharing so could um, one of us pray and then we can start, please. Anyone could just hear us in prayer? Uh, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this hour of mentoring and we pray, Father, that uh, as you uh, as you lead us in your word, Father, that your word will will guide us and help us in in our day to day lives, Father. We pray that uh, that we will able to apply, Lord, whatever we are learning, Lord, in this hour, and we pray for blessing upon the entire faculty and all the students. In in Jesus' this precious name, we pray. Amen. Okay. Can you hear now? Uh, no, we can't hear. Oh, can you hear? Okay. Is the audio clear? Um, is it loud? Okay. It's good. Audio is fine. All right. Let me just go ahead and um, um, share one slide and then we will uh, I'll share my thoughts in there. Okay, um, are you able to see the slide? Okay. I hope you are able to see it. I can't see it, you want to. Okay, I'm assuming you can all uh, see the slide. Uh, in case you can't, please somebody can let me know. All right. So what we are talking today is uh, going from vision to execution, where um, when God wants something to be done here on earth, he usually, I'm not saying all the time, but normally God co-works with us. The Bible teaches us that we are co-workers with God. Of course, there are times God works independent of man. And so when he wants to, um, you know, if he's, for example, Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus is coming back. So whether anybody prays about it or anybody you know wants that to happen the lord will come back uh, and the many things that god will do in the present of man uh, that he's sovereign and yet we see this amazing thing in, in the bible that for much of the things that god wants done here on the earth uh, especially in relation to the church or uh, in relation to what affects us uh, people god works along with us where we have co he co-works with us uh, so you and i are co-workers with god so think about this uh, and we understand this you know that god uh, in his master plan he's given each of us a portion to fulfill in that master plan so in the things that god wants done here on earth uh, little pieces of it he gives to each one of us 
And we can, each one of us can be assured that you have a part to play in God's master plan or a plan. But the question is, how, how do we, how does God, you know, lead us in this? And how does he help us do this? And I'm just sharing these thoughts here uh, with us. And then, you know, we'll open up for a, a kind of question and answers. And we can see what, what we're sharing now as a pattern in scripture, Old Testament, New Testament. And you'll just reference some of this. So generally, there's an inspiration or a calling. So just follow with me in, the number, in this cyclic, in this loop, starting with number one. There's an inspiration, there's a calling. Uh, in the case of Moses, the Bible tells us that uh, when Moses was about 40 years of age, you know, until that time he was being raised up in Potiphar's house, and suddenly it came into his heart. There, there's some awareness, a realization, an understanding came into his heart that maybe God has raised me up in this manner because he wants me to be a deliverer for his people. And so that's, it came as a very simple inspiration. This was 40 years before the burning bush. So many times we think, oh, we have to have some big supernatural encounter. Not necessary. In Moses' case, it just came as a knowing in his heart. In David's case, we can see the prophet Samuel coming and anointing. You know, he's saying, he tells Jesse to bring all the sons, and Jesse, Jesse brings everyone except David. And then he says, you know, go call David, he's taking care of the sheep. And he anoints David. So you can imagine uh, that uh, it was a prophetic moment because God had sent Samuel uh, to anoint David. Uh, but did David understand everything? We don't know whether David understood the significance of what was happening. Maybe David thought, well, here's a man, he's just anointing with oil and blessing me and praying and going. Uh, whether he understood everything at that moment as a, as a teenage boy to be being anointed by Samuel, we don't know. But that was. A prophetic moment that God was saying, David, I've got something for you. In Nehemiah's case, you will find he was working in the palace, and the news he heard stirred his heart. So in Nehemiah's case, you know, he's just doing his work, he's serving the king, but the news that comes gets his attention, it stirs his heart. That I must do something about the walls of the city of Jerusalem. So that's another different way through which the calling comes. In Paul's case, uh, it was very supernatural. Right? He's going to Damascus. He's actually an enemy of the church at that time. And it's very, very dramatic, very supernatural. That, you know, he has this encounter with the Lord Jesus. And sometimes some people have that. But you see in Moses, in David, in Naaman, it was not very, you know, very uh, as, as powerful or as dramatic as what Paul had. So the point is, the inspiration to do something can come in very simple ways. You know, uh, sometimes it can just come as a thought in your head. You know? uh, but we need to be sensitive to what God wants to have. Then God takes us, number two, is a time of preparation, a big training. Uh, God prepares us. And you see this in so many ways. You see, uh, you know, for example, in, in uh, David's life, you know, this whole journey, like in the early days of his life, he's taking care of the sheep. But at that time, he there was coverage being developed. He faced the lion and the bear, uh, and uh, he protected the sheep. That was also a time when he was uh, you know, singing, uh, playing skillfully on his hand, and singing unto God, worshiping God. Uh, so there's this preparation going on, something that God is doing. Uh, and for each of us, uh, that preparation can vary. How God does that preparation, the time when uh, uh, you know things are being built in our lives, God is training us, preparing us. Sometimes we have the opportunity to, to work under somebody else. Uh, sometimes we may do something that seems very unrelated to the calling, but even in doing that unrelated thing, there are certain you know uh, attitudes, skills, character building, formation of us. And it's taking place in that unrelated place that uh, by God is preparing uh, us for. So in David, sometimes it can, the preparation time can also be very, very difficult. You think about David's case. Uh, after he killed Goliath, he had to run for his life approximately. I don't know exactly, but about 13 years or so, he was, or uh, 17 years or so, he was running for his life. He was living in the caves. 
Uh, he was, uh, you know, all kinds of things happened during that time. But he was really, he didn't have a home. You know, he's away from his family. He's running place to place. Uh, and David is being prepared. Uh, during that preparation time also is when God sends 400 people uh, to come and join David. And David now has small army. Um, so you can see this as a part of his preparation. In Paul's case, after he has an encounter, um, we, we call this a silent years of Paul for about you know, 10 or 13 years. He's, he remains unknown. He is preaching, but there's nothing much recorded about what was he, what was he doing. He went to Arabia, he came back, and he spent most of the time in, uh, in, in Tarsus, in around Tarsus. Uh, and nobody knows uh, other than, okay, yeah, Paul is preaching, but nothing recorded. We don't know, you know whether he established churches, maybe he did, maybe we don't, we don't know. But it's the silent years of Paul where Paul is being prepared. And of course, during that time, God is giving you so much revelation, understanding of who Christ is. So we go through a time of preparation. Then, very important is location or positioning. You know, we need to be uh, in the right place at the right time for God to start unfolding. Uh, uh, his purposes. A location could be geographic, that maybe, maybe you need to be in a certain place uh, geographically. A location could be uh, under somebody's leadership or part of certain ministry or, uh, you know, long positioning yourself to launch the ministry. So that is important and varies in different people's lives. For Moses, from Midian, God said, you know, Moses, go back from, you know, he had run away from. Uh, each of God saying, no, you go back, you've got to position yourself, you've got to stand in front of Pharaoh. For David, David was running in the caves when King Saul died. David, God, God speaks to David, says, David, now you go back to Judah. You go there first. And the tribe of Judah made him king. So David was king of one tribe for seven years, even though he was the call was to be king of all Israel. Nehemiah, you've got to position yourself. He left. His place before the king, he had to go back to Jerusalem. He started looking at the city walls. Paul, Barnabas helped him. Barnabas went, looked for Saul in Tarsus, and he brought him to Antioch. So Antioch became a very important positioning for Paul. So God can use other people to guide us in this positioning. In the case of Paul, it was Barnabas who went and said, Paul, come, you must come to Antioch. Right? So that kind of, uh, in David's case, David prayed and God, David, David asked, God, God, should I go up anywhere? And God said, yeah, you go, go to the city of Judah. Mm -hmm. So God gave him clear instruction. So that location and positioning is also being what we need to be in the right place at the right time. Then there's a the communication, which is we need to share the vision, share what God has given us to do. And so you're sharing the vision because other people need to understand, you know, and maybe God will speak to them to be able to be there, that call. Now, uh, we have to wait for the right time to share the vision. If you if you look at Paul's case, you know, in his encounter with Jesus, God gave him the vision. But Paul writes in Galatians chapter 1, you know, that in the initial years, he did not discuss that with anybody. You know, he said, I conferred not with flesh and blood. So there's a right time to speak about the things that God has put in your mind. So Paul just kept quiet. He didn't go and tell the apostles, you know, God has called me to be an apostle. Yeah. In fact, the early days, nobody really believed him. The apostles were kind of doubting him. So he waited until the time came in, uh, you know, in, in Antioch. And then, then the Holy Spirit said, you know, get it. Um, while he was in Antioch, two years after being in Antioch, the next you know, move came, the Holy Spirit told him, Separate new partners and so on. Then they started, you know, going out. They did the ministry. Then they uh, later they shared with the apostles what God was doing. So the right time came to share that God has called us to reach the Gentiles. You know? Although although Paul knew that from the beginning, when he encountered Jesus, the Lord said, "You know, you bear my name before kings and before the Gentiles." He had to wait till the right time came. When he could tell me, "This is what God has called me to do." So the right time we share, we communicate the vision of the world God wants us to do. And with that comes mobilization. That means God himself starts connecting the right people at the right time. So people join us, people begin to share in the vision. 
they begin to participate in the mission, they feel called to the mission. So uh, the mobilization takes place where people are coming together. Even though God gives you a vision, many times you cannot do it by yourself. You have to be in the for body. Right? So you're joining with others and others are joining with you. So we are, you know, uh, like the body coming together. But we, the mobilization happens where you are part of a community of people or a group of people or a team of people in all the language we can use. And then that comes together, then we are working together for the vision. And we also see provision happening. That is, uh, God supernaturally makes whatever we need available. In Moses' case, you can see, and, and God, you know, God works well ahead of time. And we are making some measure very really better. But in Moses' case, when they were leaving Egypt, God moved upon the people of Egypt to give, you know, to release the wealth to the people. Now they go out of Egypt, they cross the Red Sea, they are journeying, and then God tells Moses, Moses, I want you to build me a tabernacle, tell the people to bring, you know, what they have. So Moses didn't plan for it. God planned for it, and the provision was there for whatever they needed to build the tabernacle. So God supernatural provided. In the case of Nehemiah, there was divine favor. When Nehemiah was about to go uh, to do the work, it was the king who said, hey, whatever you want, I'll provide. I'll give you soldiers who will escort you, uh, whatever wood you need, or, you know, what the materials you need, I will send it to you. So there was divine provision as well. You see this, you can see this in David's case and Paul's case. So God is, uh, people are being positioned to give it to what needs to be done. So when we are moving with God uh, and doing His will, we can be sure that the right approach will come. And I've seen this happening here, uh, even, even at APC. I couldn't have planned, uh, you know, how the money would be coming in, etc. I didn't plan. God, you know, put the right people in the right place at the right time, uh, bless them so that they could bless the church and so that we could do to carry out the ministry. And then, of course, all of this will lead us into the execution, which is doing the work. You, you, you start working, you're, you're working now, you're doing the things God's called you to do. And this is not easy. You know, this is, uh, you know, there's a lot of hard work, sometimes a lot of tears, sometimes a lot of sleepless nights, whatever. You do have to do the work. But, you know, um, you know and I, think, I like the verse in First Corinthians 15 10, it says, I am what I am by the grace of God. But the grace which was given to me was not in vain, for I labored more abundantly than all the others. And yet not I, but by the grace of God which was given to me. So he's talking about grace and work. So grace enables us to work. More grace, you're able to do more work. Uh, uh, and uh, supernaturally, you're empowered by the grace. And so even when you do more work, you realize it's not your own efforts. It's actually the grace of God helping you to do work beyond other people. And so that's the execution part. You're able to do it by grace to work, to, to really toil and labor, do the things that need to be done. Then we begin to see results. So we begin to see the fruit of, um, of the work. Uh, we begin to see the vision being fulfilled, things beginning to happen. And as this is happening, God expands our vision. That means he adds to it. This whole cycle begins to repeat. You know? It keeps on happening over and over again. You're starting off with one vision as you're seeing it go, God adds to it another. He inspires you to do something more. He inspires you to do something more. He inspires you to do something more. And the same process repeats. And maybe it repeats in a faster way because now a lot of things are in place and new things are being built. Uh, but the same, it keeps on happening and the work keeps expanding in many different areas as God keeps inspiring vision for new things. That he wants to be done. So this cycle is not just a one-time thing in your life. What, what I feel is that um, you start off in a cycle and then God keeps it keep the cycle keeps repeating as he keeps giving you new vision, fresh vision, he enlarges the vision, and you keep you know going through you see the same things happening over and over again as God unfolds his plans and purposes in our lives. Right? So let me pause here and I will, uh, you know, let's take some time for questions, discussion. Um, so the point is, uh, what has God called you to do? Or what is God um, speaking into your life? 
and uh, how are you how do you feel God is leading you to fulfill that vision or if you have any questions along those lines welcome to uh, raise it or, and, and we'll be happy to share our thoughts on it thank you Sure, sure, thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I wanted to ask regarding uh, what you mentioned regarding Paul. Uh, uh, Apostle Paul was, uh, was uh, uh, though he was given, uh, you know, clarity about his purpose and uh, vision, um, he did not share it with others That's uh, for a while. Uh, so uh, can you um, elaborate more on that or... Um, can you um, explain why that would have been the case uh, that he didn't do it? Uh, uh, is it because it was a preparation time for him or uh, like a, uh, more clarity on the vision that God has given him? Yeah, I just wanted to uh, get a clearer idea about that. Okay, uh, I can hear you. Hear you now, Divya. Uh, who were you referring to? Sorry, I missed the first part of it. What was it? It was uh, regarding Apostle Paul. Oh, okay, okay. Um, yeah, so we, we, you know, we see that um, there was these 30, uh, you know, 13, 14 years of what we call as the silent years. So you're referring to that period of time. Yes. 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 Okay. Yes. Okay. So. Uh, um, uh, I, th I think there were several things that we can see, uh, and Paul shares this in Galatians chapter 1, uh, is, uh, and we also see this in Acts chapter 9, that in the initial stage, after his encounter with Jesus, uh, uh, the, even the apostles and other believers were very suspicious of him. So they were not ready to welcome him. So even when he went to Jerusalem, uh, right after, so uh, after his time in Damascus, he went to Jerusalem for 15 days. People didn't, they didn't re uh, rec uh, you know, welcome him. And there was also persecution. People wanted to kill him. So he, uh, so that was one thing. So he had to go away, you know, for his, or for, the, for his own safety. But I also think that it was part, you know, it, that, that's one, you know, when you look at it from a natural side, that was one thing that was happening. But also from a spiritual side, I think that was a time when God was giving to the Apostle Paul the revelation he needed. So when Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 12 about, you know, being caught up to the heavens, third heavens, and when he was receiving an, uh, the abundance of revelation, he saw and heard things that you know no man he couldn't even utter. It's most likely that during this the, this time in the silent years, when he began be, really understood from the Old Testament scriptures who Jesus Christ was, and all the revelation that he had to pour into the church, um, uh, and so it, it was a time when I think intentionally designed by God to give Paul the revelation, to give Paul the understanding, which he would then release to the church. And these are two things I can think of. Now others are free, uh, are free to add to this. Yeah. And did, did that address your question, Divya, or? Yes, yes, Pastor. Okay. Uh, so this can vary from person to person, correct? It's not yes. like a general rule or like a... Yeah, yeah. So this varies from person to person. Generally, what we hear people say is, you know, the greater the call, the greater the preparation. That means uh, the preparation, of course, is in proportion to what God wants you to do. Generally, I mean, it's not a rule, but generally that's what we see. Okay. Yeah. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So there's some questions in the chat. There's... Um, uh, uh, a question from Pratt. Uh, is it must to join a local assembly of believers during the launching phase of a vision? Uh, so Pratt, um, there is no set formula and God works differently in different people's lives. Um, now, we definitely see that the norm is God works through the local church, right? So that's the norm that he that he brings people to a local church. And I like, for, since we're talking about Apostle Paul, you see that also. Barnabas goes and brings him to Antioch. 
and they are there serving in that local church in Antioch for at least two years. And after that, they are launched into the uh, apostolic ministry. So uh, that's the norm. I'm not saying um, uh, they, you know, that God will never work differently, uh, but that's the norm that he works through the local church. He works through a community or a group of believers. Um, could God use somebody, you know, just send some person in some place and start a work and do all by himself or herself? That is possible. Uh, God can do that. But we would refer to that as an exception. It's not the norm. There are always, you know, God can work differently. So that's that's fine. But the norm is you be part of a church community and then God launches you from there. Okay. I hope that helps. Um, uh, Sam, uh, could you speak a little bit more about waiting on the Lord Moses, Caleb, 40 years, versus being zealous for God and taking the kingdom violently? John the Baptist, David taking on Goliath. How does one discern? Um, yeah, I'll just share my thoughts and, uh, and then others can add to it. Uh, I think all of this has to be seen as part of our preparation, uh, even in David's case. Uh, you know, he, he was he was there taking care of the sheep. He killed the lion. He killed the bear, and then there was this opportunity to engage with Goliath. And uh, David was intentional about it, right? So when he heard that Goliath had challenged the armies of Saul, and nobody was willing going up, uh, something stirred. He went and he took it up. But it's all, it was all part of God's plan and God's preparation. You know, being in the right place at the right time, doing the right thing. Uh, killing Goliath itself was not the final assignment, but it was part of the journey. And you could say it was part of the preparation. Um, and so I think everything we do, small things, sometimes big things, like killing lions, bears, and Goliaths, or sometimes small things like taking care of the sheep or playing on the harp all by yourself uh, taking while taking care of the sheep. All of these things are adding up and are part of our preparation. And we just need to be sensitive to uh, what God wants for us as we journey with him. And uh, I think the discerning part happens when based on how, what you feel impressed in your spirit. And as you're walking with God, and I think the you know when you see David, as he journeys with God, he's constantly in communion with God. He's praying, God, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? And so you can imagine while he's in the wilderness, he's praying, God, what do you want me to do? You have a plan for me. You want me to king, be the king of Israel right now. I don't even have a home. How do you want me to go about this? And you know, I can almost imagine God saying, just hang in there. Just stay here. Your time will come. Uh, don't do anything. Don't even attack Saul. Don't. You don't have to do anything. Just, just be patient. And so he just continues that that way. You know, he, he he writes, you know, about how he just waits patiently on the Lord. And finally, in one of his time of prayer, he says, "God, what do you want me to do? Saul is dead." Then God says, "I want you to go to Judah. I want you to go to the city of Judah." So you know that discerning is happening through his communion with God, and he knows where to be, what to do, uh, through his communion with God. All right, I don't want to be talking all the time. I just want to, to let others answer. Could uh, uh, The next question is from Pratt. What is the difference between a vision, a, a mission, and a mandate? Uh, could one of our pastors please take it up? Thank you. Yeah, I just want to uh, uh, quickly share. Uh, vision is uh, like, um, maybe, uh, let's say, a vision of an organization of a person is um, who or what we want to be. It's it's got a long term, a futuristic um, a timeline, and uh, this is who we want to be. This is what we want to be as an organization or a ministry or a church. And a mission would be, um, you know, what what are we going to do uh, in order to get there? So it broadly describes, okay, this is what we're going to do. We're going to plant churches. We're going to, you know, equip people and etc. Again, it's a uh, broadly it would talk about some action that we are going to uh, do in order to get there. And the third one about mandate, uh, well, mandate is, um, is a command, uh, an instruction, um, 
a, a strong instruction or a, I think you can call it a decree or a command. Um, so yeah, so those would be the differences um, between a vision and a mission and a mandate. Yeah, hope that helps. Thank you, um, Pastor Jay Kumar. Yeah. The next question is, uh, again, also from Pratt, is spiritual father biblical? If yes, what is the rightful approach? Again, I think um, one of our pastors could take this up, please. Um, yes, uh, spiritual fathering is biblical, uh, as we, you know, uh, recently had a recently this conference, and we we talked about it, and we and we see um, Paul um, writing to Titus, and uh, he's talking about different kinds of people in the church, uh, different in level, different levels of spiritual maturity and growth, and he talks about little children, young men, young women, and then also talks about fathers, um, so uh, implying fathers and mothers, so. Spiritual fathering is um, or mothering is biblical. It's taking a person or, or group of people from a place of immaturity to a place of uh, spiritual maturity and growth. And um, and of course, the rightful approach would be to um, uh, would again what he lists down there that we would um, be people of integrity, that we would uh, uh, be people of humility, that we would have. Uh, uh, Paul talks about how he did not hold back anything that was uh, beneficial for them, and how his approach was that, uh, like a uh, um, like a um, nursing mother would care affectionately for the children. So, um, so it is with the benefit of the other person, never to manipulate them or um, and intimidate them in order to get something for us. Uh, so to serve and not to be served, and to uh, simply with the the focus on um, uh, you know ben benefiting or uh, bringing people to a place of uh, maturity so that would be the rightful approach in a nutshell that would be the rightful approach thank you thank you pastor jay kumar the next question is from jachin uh, this is about communicating our vision and calling to others is it right for us to pray and wait on the Lord to send in the right people whom God has placed in our life to move us in our calling further since Holy Spirit can speak to them directly as in the case of David not being the place when Samuel came to anoint him. Uh, David was later called by his father. A little more clarity on the communication bit. All right. So I'll just share my thoughts and others are welcome to add to it. Uh, uh, I think it's important, like, so when God is calling us, He's putting something in our hearts. Uh, yes, they need, the first response is to pray, bef pray before God. You know, you're holding it in your heart and you're saying, God, um, this is what I'm feeling. This is what I'm sensing. Uh, is this from you? And then basically, it's you uh, as a person, you're, you're, you're being convinced about what God wants you to do. That's the first thing. So it's, that's a time between you and God you're praying. And I think, but it's also important at the right time to share it with the right people. Uh, that communication needs to happen so that uh, others can uh, participate in that vision. But the key is do it at the right time. Moses did it in the wrong time. He got into trouble, right? I mean, he thought his people would, this is in Acts chapter 7, he thought that people would understand, so he went out to be a deliverer. Uh, it was just the wrong way to do it and the wrong time to do it, and he had to run for his life. But later on, God said, you know, 40 years later, he says, Moses, go back and tell the people that, you know, go, go tell Pharaoh, let my people go. And uh, God said, I will, you know, I will, you know, so be with you and so on. So that proclamation, the communication, the vision, it happened the right time in the right way as God directed. Same thing we see in the Apostle Paul's life. He had to keep quiet. Then much later, the Holy Spirit called him out with Barnabas. And then, Acts, end of Acts 14, they go back and they report you know, to the church uh, what, what the Lord had done. So then people realize, hey, th there's something happening here. These people are apostles. They're planting churches. right? So uh, uh, the communication is happening at the right time to the right people. Same thing with Nehemiah. You know, he's, the hand of the Lord is on him. Favor is happening. Everything's happening. Then he goes. He does the survey of the city. That's Nehemiah 2. And then... 
until that point, Nehemiah 2 verse 12, Nehemiah says, I told no one what God had put in my heart to do at Jerusalem. That means he realizes there's something in his heart, but till that time, he's just keeping quiet. The only person he told was the king, uh, you know, saying that this is what I feel in my heart. And king said, gave him permission to go. But till that, I'm just keeping quiet. He's doing this survey. He's checking out the place, everything. But after that moment, he tells the people, the Jews, hey, you've got to do this. And I see the evidence of God's favor on my life. You know, the king has granted me permission for all of these. Then the people mobilize and uh, Nehemiah 2.20, let us arise and build uh, for the Lord or God of heaven will prosper us. So people are mobilized uh, to participate in the vision. So to answer your question, there's a time we have to keep quiet and be convinced ourselves. Then at the right time and to the right people, we share the vision. And then that mobilizes the people uh, to participate in the vision. I right? hope that helps. Uh, anyone else wants to add? Can please do so. Any other questions, please? Um. Um, just one thought here about the provision. Um, just something to keep in mind uh, that, you know, sometimes we wonder, you know, how am I going to receive provision uh, for the work that God is calling me to do? It's, of course, ministry takes money. Anything we do requires money. How is the money going to come? Um, I'm just hearing from my personal uh, learning is that, First, we sow spiritually into the lives of people. And this is a biblical principle. We sow spiritually into their lives. That means you just serve faithfully, just sow spiritually into their lives. And then you communicate the vision. You're also communicating, saying, hey, this is what God is calling me to do, and I'm serving you. Just And don't put any pressure on the people. Don't manipulate them. Don't control them. Don't force them to give nothing. You serve spiritually. You share the vision. And then God will stir up the hearts of people to give. So we really don't have to, you know, uh, force people or uh, manipulate them, nothing. So the Bible teaches us, and you can see this in Galatians 6, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. In all these places, you can see the biblical principle is that those who serve in the word, let them be, you know, cared for by the people who are being served. Spiritually, they give back materially, right? Uh, not only for their personal needs, but also for the sake of the vision. So the principle is simple. You sow spiritually, communicate the vision, and let God speak into the hearts of people. And uh, when we do it right, we'll always find that there's more than enough supply for God. what God wants done. Uh, but if you start engaging in, you know, forcing people, manipulating them, all those things, I think uh, we end up uh, making, creating a mess of things. Yeah. Any other questions, please? So, uh, just one more thought here. Um, our progression into fulfilling the call also ha happens progressively or, you know, step by step. It's not that the day we start executing, execution, that day we're going to see the fruition of everything. No, no, no. So, the execution happens slowly, step by step, and the fruition or seeing things fulfilled also happens progressively step by step right so we shouldn't we should be patient uh, we should be diligent and keep going and the rule over there is simply this when we are faithful in small things god will increase he will make us he'll set us up about big things so example if you feel that what god wants you to do is okay i want god wants me to reach you know, one million people, 
Wonderful. But it's highly unlikely that when you start executing, you know, you're going to see one million people in front of you. It's not going to happen like that. The normal is when you start executing, you probably see 10 people or 50 or 100 people in front of you. You serve the 100 faithfully. Okay? The vision may be one million people he wants you to reach, but you have to be faithful in serving the 10 or the 50, the 100. And when you're faithful in those small things, you're doing well, you're diligently working, then God increases that, you know, okay, now you hit impact 500. Uh, then you're faithful in that. Then there's an increase, right? So that's the biblical principle. When you're faithful in little things, he sets you over bigger things. And then you progress, progress, progress. So that's key. Right? Even though the calling and the vision may be for something big, uh, the journey into that fruition of that big vision is a progressive journey. Step by step, we, we make that journey. The thing that God is looking for is faithfulness. You're doing it faithfully, doing it well, then you see that happen. Yeah. All right. Um, uh, um, uh, uh, comment there when the vision seems very big, sometimes you feel overwhelmed. How do we deal with the sense of being overwhelmed? Yeah, so I think uh, one is to understand that right in every season, uh, we just do what we are given to do in that season, and that if we are faithful in that little what God give, has given us in the season, we will then progress into the next level or the next bigger thing. and the very big vision, will we will get there eventually. So the key is to be faithful. And in every season, uh, it's God's empowering that makes us equal to the task, or be more than equal to the task. Uh, a scripture that encourages uh, us here is uh, 2 Corinthians 3, verse 5. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves uh, to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God. That means what makes us equal or more than equal to the task. Our sufficiency is from God. It's God who makes us uh, more than sufficient for any task given to us in each season. Okay? So we journey there. Okay. All right, I think we will close. Um, thank you everyone for participating, sharing the comments and so on. If any, is anyone here wants to make uh, share anything, any final thoughts before we close? Okay, so um, may I request uh, someone to lead us in prayer and then we will close and dismiss. Thank you. Anyone can pray? All right, John, John Paul, do you want to pray? Yes, yes, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for coming. Thank you for uh, helping us to come together in our presence and to uh, listen uh, together to uh, execute our visions, oh God. And you are the God who uh, leads us, oh God. And we pray that you would uh, strengthen each one of us to um, see our vision coming to fruition, oh God. We declare your goodness over our lives. We pray that every single one of us, over each one of us, oh God, we would uh, receive your favor in our lives and we would plan our lives according to your purposes and help us to see that come into fruition, oh God. Help us to execute the plans, oh God. And we ask for your uh, presence. We ask for your guidance, Holy Spirit, that you would strengthen each one of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I think we have just about enough time to head off to our classes. Enjoy your day. Enjoy the rest of the week. See you again next Thursday. God bless. Bye.